Okay, welcome everybody to the latest installment of the Microcap uh, Fund Manager Monthly. I'm delighted to be joined by Graham Carson from Cyan Investment Management in Melbourne. Graham, how are you? Uh, very well, thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me on. How are you? Good. If you can give us the quick one, two minute elevator pitch uh, about, uh, I guess, Cyan, your background, maybe a bit about Dean as well, and um, I guess the investment philosophy that uh, you guys follow at Cyan, just so uh, people are aware of kind of what kind of part of the universe you're looking at. Uh, yeah, sure. So Cyan Investment Management was founded by myself and my business partner, Dean Fergie, uh, about six or seven years ago. We own the management company. We have one fund. Um, Combined, we're the biggest investor in the fund, so I'd, I'd argue we're pretty aligned with the outcomes. Um, although we have technically an open mandate, we tend to find our uh, opportunities from an investment perspective at the smaller end and at the quite small end. So we will invest in businesses, entry point market cap of less than 50 million, um, if we see it as a real opportunity. But generally speaking, it's, it's that 50 to 200, 250 mil market cap entry point that we're looking for. Um, and we're an out and out growth fund. Um, so it has to be ASX listed or soon to be, so we can do pre-IPO. Um, we don't invest in resources companies, biotech companies, mining service companies or property, um, but we do invest in, in anything else that we think has got a growth um, phase ahead of it. Um, it needs to be proven to an extent whereby it's writing some revenue. Uh, we need to have known management well and know the business model, but it doesn't yet particularly have to be profitable but we need to see a path to profit, profitability. And we own between 20 and 40 companies at any one time with a with an investment time frame of three to five years in the ideal world. Okay, great. Uh, let's uh, get dive straight into the, the two stocks that you have today. So the first one we're gonna do is one that's been around, well, well the two stocks, one's been around for a long time, one's a, a new one to the boards, but uh, let's start with the, the longer term one, uh, Corm Group. And um, for people who mightn't have come across it in the past, then um, maybe you can just give them a quick overview about how these guys make their money. Uh, yeah, sure. So Corum Group, uh, about a 55 mil market cap. It has had a long listed life, although a reasonably unsuccessful one until more recently. Um, they're a software business that provides solutions to the, to the pharmaceutical, no, to the pharma industry, pharmacy industry. So not pharmaceutical, actual pharmacies. So that includes all the systems and, around medical dispensing, point of sale solutions, head office management solutions, basically bring all the parts of um, dispensing the product to the patient, managing the inventory and workflow with wholesalers, suppliers, communication with head office, um, within the pharmacy and all the moving parts of it. So it's a heavily compliant industry. Um, systems are critical. Uh, so these guys have been around for a while. They built up really good market share to around about 40% of the pharmacy market in Australia. Um, until about five years ago where there was a few missteps um, in terms of customer relationships and product investment and development. And the company basically unraveled to the extent where it lost half its market share. Um, there's been a complete reinvigoration with the new management team. It's been recapitalized um, and they're executing on their growth plans pretty well, albeit early days. Um, the business model itself is predominantly a SaaS model whereby they get paid license fees by the pharmacies on a monthly basis um, to license the software. And that's an average of around about five to $600 per pharmacy per month. They've got about a thousand pharmacies at the moment. So uh, that's around two thirds of their earnings and will generate between seven and 9 million in revenue this year. The other third is a volume based or clip a ticket type of sales model. That's through a business that they've acquired the balance of called Pharmex quite recently. And they're in roughly five and a half thousand of the 5,700 pharmacies across the country. Um, so it's a very, very strong and powerful strategic foothold, um, as long as a pretty good financial outcome for them as well. It'll write between five and six mil of revenue um, this year. So all up, we expect around 13 to 15 million of revenue generated, and it's profitable at around about four and a half to five mil EBITDA um, off that revenue base. Okay, great. And then in terms of, um, I guess some of the, maybe the, the, the risks around the business, it, it, are some of the risks around the, 
the integration of this like Pharmax business or uh, another kind of one I know in this space, maybe they don't compete directly head on is the, is the Med Advisor guys also based down there in Melbourne do. Uh, is it a, a fight out between the two of them for market share or, or are they kind of operating in the same industry, but kind of at slightly different levels or uh, different spaces? Uh, I think they're offering, they're obviously in the same industry, but different business models and different spaces. The med advisor business is very much consumer based um, and consumer focused, certainly domestically in its original rollout. Uh, this business is very much a B2B offering. So perhaps if we quickly take a step back and look at the industry overall, um, it might be, it might be sort of of value. Uh, so the 5,700 pharmacies, as I said, it used to be a very cottage industry where the local pharmacist in the community was very highly regarded, probably financially very well off. Um, that's sort of changed and became corporatized over the last two or three decades in Australia. So there are five or six big houses or, or, or types of companies now that, that dominate sort of two thirds or three quarters of the industry. And they are you know, chemist warehouse, with 23%, Sigma, they change Amcal, it's got 18%, and so on and so forth. So at the pharmacy level, it's quite dominated by corporates these days. Um, and these guys are gonna try and try to penetrate and get traction at the corporate level, rather than the individual pharmacy or consumer level. Um, and the one, one of the reasons they can do that is because one, they now own Pharmex, which is in all the pharmacies too. They've got 20% of the market with um, their original suite of businesses. Um, and that includes a head office product as well. They can disperse all sort of information down through the pharmacy network. So they can actually go in from the top down, which is to these corporatized, corporatized models, I think very, very attractive. So the industry itself probably isn't growing very much, but it's very political. And within that there are wholesalers and suppliers as well as the owners of pharmacists uh, and the retail offering as well. So it's a very defensive industry with a lot of complexity around it. Um, and you could argue this good sort of macro backdrop as well with the aging population. So when you put all that together, you've got to have an offering that is seamless, is cost effective, is compliant, the PBS. Um, so there's a really big barrier to entry if you've got now this network of product and service which Pharmax have acquired and developed internally, um, as have the existing um, core management. So I think they've got a very different offering, a very powerful offering. Now it just comes down to execution, um, which comes back to your original point about, about risk. There are always risks that the big companies internalize tech. Um, I think that's a, a genuine risk and we've seen it, we see it with Chemist Warehouse. Um, so you have to be careful there, although they are coming from a, 20% market share in the traditional business, not a 70% market share. Um, obviously there's always competition risk. Fred, a company called Fred is out there. That's partly owned by Telstra Health. Um, although you would argue that there are shortcomings in its business model as well. So I don't see that as a massive risk. And of course, given that you're in tech, there's always security and data risk. Um, so there are three risks. And the other one, the main one, is just probably the risk in execution around the fact that this company has come from you know, a, a testing time. So you've got probably a little bit of reputation risk that's being turned around slowly, um, but you know, those things don't happen overnight. Yeah. Okay, well, it sounds like, yeah, there's, uh, it's gonna be an interesting, let's say six or 12 months uh, ahead of between betting down this acquisition and, and the new management and board, as you said, that's come in there to kind of earn their, earn their stripes and, and you know get a couple of, um, early runs on the board. So what are you kind of looking out for as, you know, kind of some key announcements or milestones to, for Quorum to deliver over, over that kind of next six or 12 months? So let's say the balance of, of this year, 2021. Um, yeah, okay. Well, um, firstly, what they've delivered over the last couple of months is really important to what happens over the next few months. Um, they've had two capital raisings, one for five and a half mil at 4.2 cents. They're now trying to get nine cents. Um, and then another one at three point for three point three mil at five and a half cents from a company called Arrowtech. Um, Dennis Bastis is the individual behind it. He's very highly regarded in the industry. So you'd say, you know, for want of a better term, 
the smart money has been wanting to take positions um, in this company because they can see within the industry that they know or they, that they suspect that the outlook is good because the new management team is so strong. So that means they're capitalized to execute on their plans. That, firstly, that means that they can develop the product back to where they want it to be. Um, and that's well on the way to do it. Secondly, it means they can improve the sales teams and the sales capacity. And thirdly, the internal systems and management team around that. So hopefully that'll lead to um, a clear improvement in financials. We've already seen it in the first half results. Um, but it's still a 4C company. So we can expect, I think, to see top line growth and cost out margin expansion um, in the current quarter and, and again, more so in the, in the, in the fourth quarter. Um, also look for contracts around um, you know, new pharmacy groups that are signing or new supplies or wholesale agreements or even head office level um, contracts as well. And then finally, just new product releases um, and initiatives to drive traction to win market share. Because we think this is a top line story with margin expansion and, and, and genuine um, market share um, gains over the next one, two, three years. Okay, great. And as you said, there, um, Appendix 4C reporting, so we should be getting the Q3 one of those out uh, sometime in the next two weeks. Uh, let's move on to the, the second one, uh, a recent IPO, I think it was maybe just before Christmas. Not one I'm even familiar with myself, uh, Playside Studios. So maybe just give us an overview of uh, yeah, how these guys make their money. Uh, yeah, sure. This is probably a little bit less complex, so a bit easier to, 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 to understand in a few minutes. They're basically a game developer. So if you think about the games your kids would play on their mobile or their PC or even their gaming console, um, that's what these guys do. Um, you know, the Candy Crush type games, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, obviously, a very fast moving and growing industry. We know that. Um, and actually very difficult to get exposure to from an investment perspective, at least in the Australian market anyway. So they IPO'd last December. Um, they raised 15 mil um, on a market cap of about 70 mil at the time. Um, it's since traded up from 20 cents issues at the mid 30s at the moment. So you're sitting on around a 125 mil market cap uh, as we speak. Um, and what they actually do, so they obviously they've got a group of tech people that develop these, these games and they do that for either themselves, their own content, IP as, as Playside Studios or for other parties. So for example, they work with um, the large studios such as Disney and Warner Brothers uh, and Nickelodeon. Um, the revenue model itself, before I go into why we like it, um, there's this sort of three or four main different areas. One is just to work for hire or contracting work that they might do for a big studio where the big studio effectively employs, um, for want of a better term, their, own, their developers from Playside. Um, that's obviously pretty solid, provides underwrite some of the other stuff, but it's not, it comes with a cost base as you need to have the developers and it's not as much leverage in that. The original IP stuff, which is where they own the content, um, is where you can get a very, very exciting outcome if you get one very right. Um, but obviously you're spending the cost up front, taking the risk on the, on the product, um, and then hoping that you're going to get paid or based on downloads or in-game purchases because of the success of the game. So serious leverage there, but a little bit high risk. The third one is a bit of a hybrid, which is what they call their partnerships business, which is whereby they will engage with um, a partner such as an influencer. It might be someone a real heavy hitter on YouTube or someone like that. Um, and they develop a game with them where they both work on the content and they actually share the outcome or the successful upside. Now, it seems a bit silly maybe to someone of my vintage, that business model on, on a headline basis. But when that, when they explain it to me, um, it's got incredible upside. So, you know, then one of the, there's a guy called Laserbeam, who's like a top, I think he's number one or two in Australia on YouTube, top 20 in the whole world on YouTube, who talks about video games and plays video games in front of people. They're developing their own game for him and with him. And then they share the benefits of that. So that can be very exciting. And then finally, they've got an esports business, um, which again is a, a very new and very developing, and very fast growing market. It's difficult to know what the commercial outcome looks like yet and what the successful business model will look like, but they have got an equity stake in an esports business that they're, that they're working with and developing slowly 
Um, I don't attribute any value in it um, when I'm trying to value this company, but it could be, it, again, it could deliver upside. Okay. And then, yeah, I guess why you like it, is it, is it the, the, let's say, the, the combination of the revenue streams from, from the first three, or is it, uh, you know, a case of, you know, it's got a e-sports, e-gaming, you know, the whole space has got a huge kind of secular tailwind behind the industry. And, and this is one of the ways to kind of leverage that macro theme from an Australian standpoint. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're all good points. It's exactly, it's exactly that in a combined sense. Uh, it's a real growth industry. Not so much the esports that's getting us excited. Um, not because we don't think we should be, just we don't think that we need to be to justify this story as it is. And the other bit's a bit more established. The CEO, Jerry Sarkis, he's ex-EA Games, ex-Atari, seriously good at what he does, seems to be well-networked, really impressive. He's surrounded by good people from a financial point of view as well. And the three founders of the business still own more than 65% of it. So there was basically no sell down in IPO. So, you know, they are very, very much focused on this being the start of the journey. It's already proven, it's already doing 10 million in revenue uh, this year. And uh, if they weren't investing for growth, and they could run it at, uh, at profitable levels right now. We're glad they continue to invest for growth. They've, they've now got, they're now armed with the capital they raised from, from the listing, which is, you know, 15 million bucks. Um, they can buy developers, they can buy sales, they can do all the things that, that they haven't been able to do over the last nine years since they established the business. Um, uh, and if you get one of these IP content, one of those IP games where you own the content right, they can be worth in, incredible amounts of money. So financially, when you look at it on a 10 to 12 multiple revenue, um, could run a break even, no debt, strong cash, great team, fast moving industry, one of the only exposures you can get in the Australian market. Um, yeah, we think it could be exciting. And then I guess some of the, some of the, the key risks from it is, it, is it, is it coming from, you know, the, the self-developed games, I guess, where, you know, unfortunately, as is the nature of the beast, you know, you can plow $3 million in, you know, a year, 18 months. I, I'm guessing off the top of my head now, you know, pu pulling together a game, go to market and, you know, you just don't get the ROI uh, that you're looking at. And I mean, that is the nature of the beast, I guess, with, with the business model. Is that, that kind of one of, the, one of the biggest risks or is there kind of anything else in there that, you know, kind of, you're wary of or, or people need to kind of bear in mind if they're looking at it? Uh, yeah, the one you mentioned is the biggest, but I mean, to start with, as we know, in micro caps, when you're investing in IPOs, that comes with risk. It hasn't got a long list of life. Um, the management, generally speaking, and in this case, haven't run a listed company before. Um, so there's a little bit of that, that risk around it. But from a business model perspective, Yes, I think the spend on the on the on the owned IP content stuff is probably the biggest risk. As a, as a as a caveat to that, I would say though that these guys are good at um, customer acquisition, so they're actually very good at doing research as they are developing the game, um, and they know which way to push and pull and what's going to what's going to get traction, what's not. Now that doesn't cover. That's probably a little bit easier on the on the lower cost games and the bigger ones because you have to put so much time and content into the game um, at the bigger end before you get any feedback but that's probably the biggest risk um, but again marginally offset by the fact that they do do um, work for some of the bigger studios and get get income and cash flow generated from from the much lower risk um, not op stuff okay and then i'm guessing just by the nature of the business that you're saying, they're going to be in another Appendix 4C one. So we should be seeing something from them in the next two weeks. Uh, what are you looking for in that one as, uh, as kind of their first Appendix, you know, it'll be their second one um, yeah. coming up and, and kind of over, over the balance of, of 2021? Is it just making sure that the core business keeps tracking along, you know, to keep the, the revenue coming in the door while they're working on some of these more... Um, original IP games? Um, to an extent, I'm not, I'm not too worried about any of the four C's at the moment, or even looking for clear catalysts in the four C's. The only thing that the four C could bring would be a red flag, whereby 
um, you know, there's been a big lumpiness in income, which can happen in these sorts of businesses. Um, but generally speaking, as long as you see that revenue tracking to an extent, um, cost base will go up as they develop IP content themselves. Um, so for me, the actual positive share price catalysts in this case are going to be more along the lines of um, the release about new games from development, console development games, buying new titles to work with. They originally bought, um, I'm working with one of the studios on Legally Blonde game, which sort of sounds a bit tired as a concept, but it's a real household name and there's a new movie being released this year. So things like that, I think people see the, people see the announcement and don't understand what, how much financial leverage there could be in it because they're yet to see this company prove that. So I think it's more important that we get this constant flow of announcements around, around new game development, new names, new partnerships and alliances um, than it is about watching, watching the financial line of the business. Yeah, it's a bit, uh, yeah, I guess a bit, a bit like Quorum Group, it's a, it's a bit about execution uh, as much as anything else. Graham, we're going to we're gonna leave it there. Thanks for the two names. Um, really interesting. I, I, I don't think yeah, there are ones that will be on many people trade out, which is good. It's always good to uh, unearth new, uh, new names in this space. If people want to find out more about your fund or, and the business, uh, what's, the, what's the best way to get in touch? Um, you can, actually, on the website, with Cyan IM, Cyan, Cyan IM for Cyan Investment Management, .com AU, um, there's just an info page there where you can get all the info you need, and there's a contact uh, email that will come straight to Dean and myself. Um, so any inquiries, let me know. I will, I will call that we're a wholesale fund, um, okay. got a retail fund, um, and we're going to keep it small. So we're just under 50 at the moment. We'll close it at 100 um, so that we can keep investing in these fund names down the smaller end, and they can still have some sort of material contribution to the performance. Okay, great. Okay, that's great, Graham. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we'll leave, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Mark. No problem.